what I thought I'd do is just touch on a couple of uh, issues that I think would be of interest. First, I want to just talk a little bit about uh, who NGA is and, and who our members are. Uh, I want to just talk for a few seconds then about kind of today's consumer uh, and a little bit about who that is and, and kind of what they're looking for and what they're engaged in. I want to touch just briefly on a couple of key issues that NGA is uh, working on that I think we might have some, some, uh, some interest uh, among our lines there. Uh, a couple of initi initiatives that the industry uh, uh, is working on as well that might be of interest. And then finally, uh, kind of wrapping up uh, what really the purpose of me being here today is to talk about how we can, uh, you know, improve communications throughout the supply chain. So first, let me tell you just a little bit about kind of who NGA is. Um, NGA is unique in that we represent the independent sector of the supermarket industry. So we have about 1,500 member companies uh, that are all shapes and sizes, from a, a small single store operator in rural Kansas to a uh, operator that has uh, hundreds of stores in multiple states doing billions in sales. What is unique about our members, they're either family owned, they're privately held or employee owned companies. Um, as opposed to more of a, a publicly traded entity. We also represent the, uh, the wholesaler uh, component of the industry, and uh, that includes the, the distribution companies that supply our stores. Many are cooperatives, which is really uh, interesting in our industry in that the retailers own these companies and have come together uh, under this cooperative uh, for, of course, you know, uh, efficiency in the supply chain and, and have been uh, done very well with that. Um, Within the industry, we, we represent our members uh, have about 20,000 uh, retail locations that they own or operate, uh, and annual revenues between the retail and wholesale side exceed about $200 billion uh, uh, annually. Our members really are the true entrepreneurs of the community. We also have manufacturer suppliers uh, and other partners that are, are, are members of our uh, association, and finally, uh, our partners at the state level, state grocer and retail associations. So what I want to just take a couple seconds and just talk a little bit about kind of, you know, who today's consumer is. So I think this is really important and really interesting. I pulled a couple of just this few little excerpts from a, uh, our 2012 uh, Supermarket Guru Consumer Panel Survey that we do. And I think one of the most uh, interesting things in there, and important of course for, for my members, is where do you purchase the majority of your foods? And still almost 84% of the consumers out there uh, shop in the supermarket industry, traditional supermarket format. However, we are seeing more and more uh, consumers that are moving to alternate formats, maybe it's the dollar stores or, or, or other um, uh, formats that are out there. Uh, one other thing we're very much seeing that, that's interesting to us is we're seeing maybe it's the drugstore channel or um, dollar stores are becoming uh, authorized SNAP, other, the new name for food stamps uh, vendors. And we've really seen a growth in that area uh, which is something that we're obviously very interested in because these are not traditional uh, um, supermarkets with the wide selection that, that our members have. Uh, another thing I thought was very interesting for our consumers, 74% um, uh, say that high quality meats are very important to them. And what's really important for our, our members to understand that is, is, is our guys uh, still have the butchers in the store. We still very much go to market in many of our marketplaces uh, on the on the perish going to market focusing on perishables, whether it's on the, the, the meat side or the seafood side or the produce uh, aisle, uh, in addition to, to some other components. So for us, it's a very important number and something that we need to make sure we're continuing to be in tuned in to our consumer. Uh, and finally, in nutrition and health information available for shoppers, I thought this was interesting. Uh, you know, 34% say it's very important, but almost 40% say it's somewhat important. And I bring this up because we are seeing more and more of our members uh, depending on the marketplace they're in, getting engaged in this, whether they are, or have point of sale materials that, that show uh, the product is gluten free or something is uh, um, um, sugar free or low fat, uh, whatever it might be, we're definitely seeing um, more of our members go to market uh, because the consumers are demanding it. Um, we are seeing this particular in areas where you've got, you know, the boomer generation is is coming of age where they're very focused on, on being more healthy and, and conscious of what they're eating. So kind of just you know, pulling this together, grocery stores are still very important, they're still relevant. You know, we've seen so many different uh, models come out there, um, but it all comes back to the grocery store is still important, but we really as grocers need to be focused on that and make sure we're taking care of our consumers. Quality of perishables, again, is very important. I think one of the most important things that 
I'm going to tie together towards the end that we should leave here with today is that today's consumer is very informed. Uh, and, and this comes to an, area of inst an era of instant communication, whether it's Google, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Pinterest, whatever is out there, uh, our, our consumer uh, can get information almost instantly, whether it's on a product, uh, whether it's something that's happened. Um, I can tell you my wife, before she you know, wants to know something, I mean, she knows about it on Facebook or, or whatever else she's communicating with her friends on before it even comes close to hitting Main Street Media. Uh, and I'm talking things that happen in the stores. And I think also something to keep in mind as we talk about uh, this throughout today is that consumer, if they have a bad experience or they have a good experience, want to tell somebody about it. And they're going to pull out that, that smartphone and they're going to start typing while they're in the, 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 um, the parking lot or maybe still in the store uh, about their experience or about experience about a product or what they saw. So I think that's very important to keep in mind. One thing I wanted to, to kind of touch on a few key issues that uh, are important for NGA that I think we might have some, some, uh, some kind of shared interest uh, here. This by no means encompasses all the issues we've got going on from tax to labor, health care, but I want to talk about, first about food safety and labeling. You know, when we, I talk to my members um, and, and to other folks, I say, you know, food safety is and has to be our number one priority. It is very simple. If the consumer doesn't have confidence in the food, the products that we're selling in the store, we are out of business. And I think that is really, really important to remember. Uh, so we need to make sure that, that we are, are getting, uh, make sure the consumer has trust in our products and has trust in, in, in our stores. Uh, you know, grocers are really the last line of defense, and we talk about the bioterrorism or the food, the food uh, supply chain. Um, you know, many of you guys are the first line of defense. We're at the end of the supply chain, and together we have to protect our nation's su uh, supply chain, food supply. Uh, the Food Safety Modernization Act uh, is obviously a, you know, a, a major piece of legislation that the FDA is going through writing regs on right now. And I'm not going to get into all the details of that, but I just want to touch on just a couple of components that, that we've been kind of engaged in. Um, one you know, thing about um, uh, the Food Safety and Modernization Act, a couple of components that were particularly uh, important to us. One, the FDA got mandatory recall authority, uh, which in cases where um, and it's rare, but you have a company that does not voluntarily engage in a recall, class one recall, uh, you have new authority for FDA to be able to, to get that product out of the supply chain. Uh, fees were only uh, for, for uh, on the inspection side, uh, especially for our wholesale members, uh, would only, um, only be implemented for reinspections, and that's something that we were focused on. And also I think what's very important for us is the whole idea of risk-based science, that we're not uh, out there um, making policies just for the, the, um, the fun of it or because somebody has a hunch that's the way we do that we're backing things up by science-based uh, facts. Um, some of the areas that we're wor working in, one is the whole kind of traceability area, product tracing. Um, part of the Food Safety Modernization Act instructed the FDA to come up with a pilot programs and they've gone through uh, two different channels. One is on a processed food um, 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 channel and the other is on a, a fresh uh, a perishable product, um, fresh fruits and vegetables. We're engaged uh, with the uh, Institute for Food Technologists, which is kind of leading this uh, effort for FDA on the processed food um, uh, channel, and they are working through that. Um, I know that, uh, and then there's a confidential agreement that, that I know we're part of, but I, I know that uh, they have gone through the process. They are actually have developed, uh, picked a product. They went through and did a test recall on the product to see how quickly they could get it off the shelves and get a response uh, through a selection of the supply chain um, and they're working through that process uh, right now and, and trying to come up with some recommendations. Um, when we talk about um, the traceability, we've got our mem many of our members, a number of are involved in Produce Traceability Initiative. But they are not just looking at that for produce. They're making the investment in the traceability. They see value in that beyond produce. They see value in that, frankly, in the meat section, to be able to know um, you know, this box of shoulder clods came in from, from uh, you know, this supplier on this date, and we, sh we know we shipped it out to this store on this date at this time. And that information is important for food safety aspect, but it's also important for supply chain management and better inventory controls. And so as I know, a number of our members are working on uh, the Produce Traceability Initiative, the PTI component. They are also looking at this more globally 
and how can we use what we're developing, because this is not cheap, it's not, you know, it takes a lot of man hours to develop this, but how can we potentially use this uh, in other areas of our facilities? One thing about that that I will just say is it has to be automated. We've, we've really pushed that to FDA is we cannot have a labor-intensive manual process. We're all about efficiency, sufficiency, and supply chain is so essential to keep the cost of goods down, to keep the product moving uh, to our stores. And so we've really got to have uh, efficiency and technology needs to be a very uh, big part of that. Um, we'll also just reportable food registry, just mentioned quickly, uh, that came out uh, in uh, 2007 law, and it impacts uh, primarily our wholesale members. Um, a central portal is what we have now, for the ability for uh, the public, um, public health organizations, and for the industry in particular to report uh, items that might be out there, that whether it's a facial cream or uh, dog food or, or a human product that could potentially cause serious injury health uh, to humans um, or animals to be able to report it up, up through the reportable food registry. The fine thing I want to say is um, what our members have really gotten to, to realize, and, and, and it gets more apparent every day, is how important it is, I'm going to talk about going back to the top here, food safety being the number one most important thing for our members, um, really experiencing that throughout the store. Uh, and so for us, certified, certified food retail manager uh, training, there's a number of, of, of those out there. We've partnered with the Food Mark Institute to push the Safe Mark uh, program. Um, we've got one of our members who owns three stores up in the uh, East Coast area who actually, out of all three stores, there's over 200 of his employees trained um, as certified food uh, safety managers. So again, critically important area. Just briefly talk about uh, you know, labeling, country of origin labeling, uh, which I'm sure you, you guys are very familiar with, um, has been a challenge for us. Um, recently, we've had some challenges, um, particularly um, on the inspection side. We've had a number of inspectors. You know, the feds have kind of pushed this uh, inspection process out to the states. Uh, and there's some confusion out there. Some inspectors don't realize that a store can have up to five days to get the documents to them, that they don't have to produce them right away, how things need to be labeled, what needs to be labeled, where it needs to be labeled. So we're working with USDA on that. Um, on that, you know, the, the World um, uh, Trade uh, Organization, WTO, uh, recently came out and uh, upon a challenge from Mexico and Canada, struck down uh, components of you know, the U.S. cool uh, law saying that um, uh, it violated free trade barriers. Uh, the U.S. has, uh, I think last month, uh, agreed to appeal. They're going to appeal that uh, back to the WTO. But I say that in context of uh, we've been dealing with cool for a number of years and we're not done dealing with it yet. We're going to uh, likely see uh, this probably potentially come up in congressional uh, uh, legislation, maybe um, likely not this year, but probably in next year potentially. Uh, particularly if there are any fines that the USDA is forced to, to pay. Um, one, one other uh, area that has been really tough for our guys is dealing with USDA meat nutritional labeling. Uh, USDA required our, our, our members to put on the pack label, on the pack labels for ground product. Um, and for our guys who are doing a lot of in-store grinding, they're taking their trim and they're you know, grinding it, uh, it's been a little bit of a challenge for them. Okay, well, how do I label this? What is it uh, exactly? And while the USDA gives some variants, that has been a, a challenge for our guys and, and has been expensive. Uh, we've had many members of it go out and buy all new uh, scale systems to be able to, to implement, um, um, to get the new labels where they can pr print this new information on there. That's been an area that we've been, we've been trying to help our members comply with and get them through that. And finally, just briefly, FDA menu labeling uh, in the Health Care Act, there was a provision that um, required mainly chain restaurants to have menu labeling. Um, and the FDA is potentially looking at um, having a broad interpretation of that that could suck in grocery stores um, and potentially even suck in smaller grocery stores that happen to be part of, like I said, those cooperatives or maybe go to, go to market under an IGA banner or a Piggly Wiggly banner. They might see them as a chain. Uh, so that's something we're working on as well so that we can, um, you know, make sure that the FDA understands that we're grocers, we're not restaurants, we're not chain restaurants, and, and, and um, it would be incredibly costly and burden, burdensome for us to have to implement that. Just want to talk about recalls briefly. Um, you know, when recall happens, our members in particular, um, because they're not necessarily a huge uh, company out there with a big headquarters facility, 
uh, might be looking, they typically would look for to their wholesaler or to NGA, hey, let us know what, what recalls are out there that are pertinent to us. And we have a recall program. We push that out uh, through there. We're also partners of the Rapid Recall Exchange, which is gaining, gaining momentum. Um, this was uh, administered by GS1, and there are more and more companies coming on board um, um, as we speak uh, to be part of kind of a single uh, tunnel to get the information out there. But until that's really up, at, up and running at a speed where everyone's, we've got a majority of people on board, there are going to be, continue to be other venues to get information out there. And I want to say again about the, the, the customer. We talk about community to the customer. It's so important that we're really uh, making sure that customer knows that when there's a recall out there, that we've taken care of the situation immediately, that we let them know that we have and what's going on, and we can communicate that out there uh, to them, whether it's in-store, uh, point-of-sale uh, materials. We have uh, some of our wholesalers actually have robocall um, capabilities for class one recalls in particular to their stores. Uh, we also have some retailers out there who have um, frequent shopper programs that have the ability to robocall their customers based upon what they've bought. Uh, and again, emails and social media, I think, is an important um, component there. just want to very quickly talk about a couple of technology initiatives because I think technology just is so important in who we are today as a business and what we're kind of uh, working on. Um, one of the most significant changes for our members, just so you know, has been a, a transition from... Uh, the traditional UPCA, what they call the UPC barcode that's been around for years and years, to a new GS1 data bar. And you might notice on some coupons you'll see a, kind of two barcodes on there. That more longer one is a, a GS1 uh, barcode. And so we've been going through that process to make sure our members have, are up to speed. Uh, many have uh, had to invest in new scanner systems, and, and it's been uh, um, expensive. But it's the future. It's where things are going. And so we're really doing outreach to consumers. Um, and, and you'll be seeing this uh, new technology really roll out into other areas of the store as time goes on. Coupons. Gosh, we've seen the shows on TV, the explosion of these, you know, coupon maniacs. And uh, um, <clears throat> it's presented some challenge forces at retail, as you can imagine. Um, so we've really, uh, have, with that, seen ex an explosion of coupon fraud. And we're really working to make sure that we're communicating to our members proactively uh, through groups like the Joint Industry Coupon Committee, when there's a fraudulent coupon out there, there's a network to get that information out to the stores uh, so they know that, hey, be on the lookout for this. Make sure your cashiers know, uh, you know really what's going on. Uh, and just to, to kind of start bringing things to a close, some other issues, 2012 Farm Bill. I know every single person in this room is quite aware uh, of that and, and that enormous process that is going on. Some of the areas that we're interested in, uh, particularly the food stamp component, uh, there's been, obviously, you've probably heard uh, a lot of proposals. Uh, the Senate Farm Bill made some significant cuts. The House uh, Ag Committee, through, through the reconciliation process, uh, has recommended some cuts from the food, food stamp side. Um, so we're watching that very carefully because as our economy is in still a recovery mode, many of our, our, our retailers have seen their, their customers fall on hard times, and many of these customers are dependent partially on SNAP benefits to be able to put food on the table and to keep shopping at our stores. So it's something we're very much focused on. Now there we're focused on in SNAP, just so you're aware, is there's been a push to make SNAP more prescriptive, meaning you can't buy a Coke with it or you can't buy a bag of potato chips with it. Um, that is a slippery slope for, for our stores. The administrative costs go through the roof. And just think in your head, um, you can't buy carbonated beverages. Well, Okay, you can't buy a Coke, but you also can't buy that bottle of Poland Springs water because it has bubbles in it. Or you can, you can buy this potato chip, you can't buy this one. We're fearful of a good foods, bad foods list um, at USDA. Food deserts were very involved in healthy food finance initiatives. So you've seen areas where they've lost grocery stores are trying to hold on to them. Our members are doing a lot uh, in that area in particular um, to really uh, overcome some barriers to be able to get in there and, and, and bring some stores to some communities. We've got California, New York State, um, among others, that are really uh, have had some success there. And transportation, which I know is important. Uh, Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration came out with some regulations that would impact the hours our drivers can drive. Um, and we are supporting efforts to challenge that um, uh, through the, the legal process. And just to wrap things up, finally, I think it's so important that you know, our topic today about really communicating through supply chain and how we really need to do that, that proactively. 
Um, you know, we got hit, as you guys did, a, a few weeks ago, or maybe it's a month ago, with this whole pink slime, you know, um, um, disaster. And it went viral so quickly. I mean, everybody's on Facebook, and everybody, and, and you know, oh my gosh, this is terrible. I can't believe my kids in school are having this product. And they had no idea really what was this product. You know, I mean, we're not, it's, what is this? And, and, and <clears throat> they didn't have the facts. And I think it's so important that, um, you know, we, and I'm speaking from NGA's perspective, that we have resources uh, ahead of time proactively so that when situations like this happen, our members know where to go right away to get the, get the facts and to be able to make that available to their customers, whether it's through social media, or putting signage up at the stores, or having pamphlets out there. Um, we can't wait a day or two to get this information out there. We've got to do it within minutes. And so we've got to be prepared. And so my message to you is to the extent that you might know what the next issue is, what's next that might hit, what are you concerned about, that we're having a conversation through the Animal Agriculture Alliance or directly with us at NGA so that we've got the facts ready to go and when something happens, we can pull the trigger and get the information to our members. What I will say, um, finally, is that consumer demand will drive what retailers do. No retailer is going to stand out there and say, I'm sorry, ma'am, you might not want this product, you're wrong, I'm going to shove it down your throat, you've got to eat it. <laughs> or, I'm sorry, ma'am, I don't think this product's right for you. I'm pulling it off the store shelves, even though the majority of our customers want, want, want it. I say that because that happened with the lean, finely textured beef incident. You had stores where the consumers demanded you get it off the shelf, and you had stores in other areas, like in the Midwest, where they pulled it from the shelves, and the consumers said, what are you doing? We know this product's fine, and by the way, these are our jobs. And they brought it back. Um, so I think what it comes down to is labeling is really important, telling the consumer what it is so they have the information, and making that information available so that they can go get it, they can educate themselves, um, and, and they know what's going on.